Glad you could join me today. Today I thought we'd do a fantastic little painting that it's a lot of fun. I think you'll enjoy it. The show is about to start. Thank you for your cooperation. Enjoy the show and please come back and visit us again. Everybody. Welcome to the Nine Years Podcast with Nick Draper and Stuart Deacons, episode 109, episode 109, Thursday the 23rd of November 2017. I've got a beautiful script that I spent hours, fingers to the bone, in front of my keyboard earlier typing out, but I'm going to ignore it because we are coming to you to the sound of, well, you recognise this music, don't you, Stu? Yes, of course I do. And what does that mean? What do you think? Who is, who is back in perhaps the WWE? I don't know. I'm trying to think who left. I get confused who leaves and who doesn't. It sort of like seems like a conveyor belt. Who might I potentially be referencing? Is it a female? Yes. Is it um, Paige? There we go. Oh, bless. She's back. Oh, well, she turned over a new... Well, she's... The, 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 the story never ends. No, let's not talk about Paige turning over anything, let's be honest. Um, yeah, so, yeah, we've now got the little competition now because Paige is back, Alexa Bliss. <laughs> Blimey. Spoiled for choice. Spoiled sure you are. for choice. Also spoiled for choice, looking back through the calendar. The, I guess calendar is the right word. Or diaries, whatever you want to say. Back to on this day, Thursday the 23rd of November. We talked a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, about Wallingford. Did you also know that a few years ago, in fact, four years ago on this day, we drew one all away at Berry? in League 2. Do you know who scored for Barry that day? Do you happen to remember? I'm trying to think it would have been back then. Tom Saws, maybe? Not Tom Saws. That's a good guess, though. Um, no, I'm not sure. Let me just give you a little bit of a clue. I'm a big fan of this striker currently. Big, big fan of his at this very moment in time. Uh, is it Barry? It must be a Luton connection, I'm sure I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think who's got... Who plays you nowadays? Daddy Hill would have been there, would he? Danny Hilton, indeed. Ah, oh, bless him, he stood up with. He was on his feet long enough to score against us. And <laughs> three minutes. Was he really, did he really score for Berry? Yeah, he scored against us for Berry. I think Luke Moore equalised. I forgot when he went there. Mm. Funny old game, a bit, he? he has, he has. <laughs> so is Paige. So we're about three minutes in. <laughs> we've talked about wrestling, we've talked about Luton Town. I suppose now we should probably be talking about AFC Wimbledon, just for a change. Would be nice, wouldn't it? And this week following the release of the BBC's annual Price of Football survey, allied with a number of EFL clubs being sent the length and breadth of the country for a midweek fixture list, we thought we'd assess the time and money fans are spending to follow their teams, and, of course, in particular, following AFC Wimbledon, because, let's be honest, Oldham away on a Tuesday night, that's really testing your mettle, isn't it? Also, Abdu you, of course, and we're going to preview our big European fixture with Warsaw on Saturday as well. But first, let's talk about that Oldham game. And, Stu, without doubt, I think the Bristol Rovers win last week has certainly given the team a bit of leeway. And had we not won at Rovers, probably fair to say that people would not have, or probably would have been actually, a lot more negative about the goalless draw at Boundary Park. Yeah, we said it didn't we were our Facebook Live um, from the ground that we were on, on Tuesday night. Um, yeah, I think it is. I think, um, you know, it results in isolation. Um, you can... You can have a little bit of a go, but when you, you know, for us, for us on the back of Bristol Rovers, uh, the FA Cup performance, the Peter performance, you can accept a nil-nil. You go, actually, do you know what we're picking up? It's, it's, the difference is you're not picking up the points. You know, you, you can't keep getting single draws. Um, so I, I know, I think you and I, um, Kevin and Mark, were a lot more upbeat than we were for, I'd say, for a home draw. I'm trying to think of the draws we've had at home games, but you know, some of the draws you've had at home or performances at home have been really poor. But like, Tuesday night, you accept it. We did. Let's be fair, we, we rode our luck. And if you look at the stats, yeah, we won and rode our luck. We didn't accept the draw. I was not happy with it. And if you'd have offered it to me beforehand, of course, I would have, well, yeah, snatched it out of your hand. But, however, on reflection, 
giving it a bit of time, a bit more thought. It's another game in which we've not had a shot on target. And we've now not scored away from home in 10 of our last 15 league games. So as much as you're right, and we've put this nice little run together unbeaten in four in all competitions, if you're judging it, the Bristol Rovers performance aside, what we're looking at is a team that is scrapping and scraping for results as opposed to perhaps... I don't think we've changed particularly as much as that Bristol Rovers result would have suggested. Still very defensive, still really struggling to create anything. Bristol Rovers has certainly proven to be the exception rather than the rule currently. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because if you look at teams like Northampton, they, they lost 2-0 at Plymouth uh, on Tuesday night. Um, obviously, Bristol, we, we put three against Bristol and we could have had six or seven. Um, I suppose those sort of teams probably would, I suppose in a way, swap our defensive. We, we, we are very good with our defensive. Uh, we're good in our cover, so we've got more than enough centre arse. We've got more than enough central midfielders. So we are very um, comfortable in those positions. And I suppose Neil Hardy isn't going to get too much away from having a solid base. Oldham was a prime example for that. It's OK if we pick up the points. Now, of course, that's, you know, 15, not scored in 15 of those games. Yeah, we've got to, we've got to try. I think we've got to try and get to the window um, in the best form we can. Turn, we, we're hearing a lot about have we turned the corner. I know we, we sort of spoke about that. Uh, on Facebook Live a lot. Um, I think we are gradually, but when do you know? You, when do you know if you turn that corner? I suppose probably won't know until we get to to Christmas because it only takes a few good results from teams around us for us to then get self caught back in the bottom, the bottom four. There's no one. No, the league's very tight. Um, so we, I suppose, we just need to get to the window um, and then get more um, attacking flair because we we missed that still. See, I look at it and I wonder, aside from a target man, do we need much else? I'll tell you for why, because although I've mentioned there our problem scoring goals away from home, so as I say, in two-thirds of our last 15 games away from Kings Meadow, we failed to score. And I was looking at the league table. We did actually, on a, going into that Bristol Rovers game, we were the lowest scorers in League One. Thankfully, then we overtook Plymouth, but then following Tuesday night, back we go again. We are back to being the lowest scorers in the division once more. And I looked at our goal scorers this season. So we've scored uh, 14 goals in the league this season. Okay, Lyle Taylor's got four. Andy Barcham, three. Two each for Quezzy Apaya, Harry Forrester and Cody McDonald. One for Jimmy Abdu. That is the team that is not sharing the goals around at all, in fact. If you think there, we've got five front players and Jimmy Abdu with our very first goal of the season back in August, at the start of August. So really, I think... We're looking at the team in other areas. Defensively solid, yes. But we need more from them going forward, though, surely. Surely. Yeah, I agree. I'm just actually just looking at the ratio of, um, in the league, actually. And it's, yeah, we are the lowest goal scorers, aren't we? So I'm just looking here. 14, 14 goals for, 20 against. Looking around us. So you've got Northampton 15, Gillingham 15. Yeah, no one else really. Above that, people have scored. Doncaster 19, Bristol 26. Uh, 30. So yeah, you do you do have got more goals. Well, I think I think one of the things that I think we sort of touched upon a little bit is we are defensive. We are so defensive, but we also we don't really get much from our fullbacks. Um, we ain't, we're not getting much from our set pieces. So we we, we covered that the other week, didn't we? About our set pieces, so we're not getting. I'm, I'm just looking at that list there in terms of if you look at how many centre halves. Have, well, there's no centre halves. I'm just looking here. The, um, no centre arse got any goals today, so we've got nothing from Darius, Deji, Nightingale, Robson, Robinson. Sorry, who you, you think would get goals? Are we not getting enough from our fullbacks? Uh, one of the things that struck me on Tuesday night watching Oldham was how much their fullbacks got forward um, and created the extra overlap and, and crosses and stuff like that. We we don't get that, do we? So it isn't just a target man that we need. We somehow need to maybe get some more. Um, options attacking wise from our our defensive areas from set piece and open, and open play. And we could get into a conversation about midfielders and centre midfielders as well. But let's leave that one for this week. <laughs> I think we've probably spoken about those players enough for the time being. The reason I mentioned though Target Man there is because Oldham's pitch was easily the worst we've played on this season, isn't it? I mean I yeah. can't I mean Bristol Rovers probably wasn't great either actually. Like no, it was nowhere near the level of Oldham's. And we have got 
difficult away games coming up. I think we've got Berry in the league. Their pitch is a bit of a nightmare. Portsmouth, Portsmouth and Gillingham, not bad, but not the best. Nothing compared to what we've got now. So going away to these sorts of places, especially at this time of year, going into deepest, deepest winter in December, surely we need that target man. That's what we were suffering from against Oldham. The ball wasn't sticking. We couldn't get the ball up, someone to hold it up for us on those awful pitches. Our passing was poor. I think Tom Saws particularly, I know he said we wouldn't talk about central midfielders, but not sure why he was taken off at half-time. Neil Ardley wasn't asked or didn't say, but he was given the possession away a lot. And that comes with the pitch as well. I think Deji struggled on it even. So just having that long ball week, and you can see Oldham, how they benefited from being able to chuck a ball up and winning a header. Yeah, but I think if you, if you look at the Oldham game, we didn't really try and keep possession. Um, I, I lost count of the amount of times that we um, the ball dropped in the sort of like the, the, our third um, of the defensive area, and the amount of times we literally just went as far. We knocked it into the channels. We knocked it for Cody and Lyle to chase, but we didn't really. We never really tried to play any football. But I, and I don't. I don't believe the pitch had been that much better. Whether we would try to, I think we set up very much to contain them, not concede anything. We, you know, we were playing against a team that had one of the top goal scorers. Um, I don't think we, we... We basically got all we went for. We went for a point. We do, though, however, you know, as that is older on isolation, um, I do think we obviously need a lot more of a target man, an offensive midfielder. We do desperately miss Dean Parrott um, because we have nothing coming from that central area that really wants to go in and join in. Um, so, yeah, there are... The target man is is without doubt, but I hope we don't just stop at a target man. I hope we do look at potentially an attacking midfield if we don't get Dean Parrott back before Christmas. Do we also need a bit of competition for Andy Barcham, who, judging by a couple of times, maybe not so much, Bristol Rovers scored the goal, of course, he was very praised rightfully, but against Peterborough, I didn't think it was one of his better games at all by any stretch. Same again on Tuesday night. We just think he's just played pretty much every game and really needs a bit of a rest. Probably, but I think we have some positions that we just can't double up on. Um, so what I mean is like you can double, you can have competition with places and that is where, that's where your your budget for your squad does it, does you a little bit. You know, We've got competition with places in midfield, but that's because we just went too heavy with central midfielders and, and arguably we went too heavy with cent, um, centre-halves. But yeah, you're right. The, sort of the, wide, the wide positions, do we really have any competition for... Andy Barcher, not really. Do we have any competition for Lyle? Nope. Do we have any competition for Cody? Nope. <laughs> so we are a little bit. Is that is that our victim of our budget? Um, that sometimes we might have to just accept that some players are going to play regardless. Um, but we do. You want your front two. You want your front two to have some competition. But I suppose what we want is really our competition, maybe coming from our our kids and stuff. Um, but we haven't really. Edgar Carger plays a different side to. Um, Barch, but yeah, I don't think Barch has got any competition. We're still lucky to have him this time of season. Normally, we've got an injury by now. Yeah, that's true, actually. This season, he's all right. It just seems that everybody else is injured. I think when you look at that bench as well on Tuesday night, I mean, blimey, there are just no options, as you say. I mean, we could be almost sounds like we're flogging a dead horse now with this argument, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, but, but you know what? The only, the only argument you can have about the options is to get a few loans in. I know we're a little bit reluctant sometimes, aren't we? But a lot of other clubs in the league are getting there, are getting quite a lot of loans in. We, I think we've been burnt so many times through that. Um, but that's any that's the only other option you've got is to, and sometimes clubs are more are, are more prepared to loan out their their kids or their fringe players in the second window in the January window than they are in the early windows because of all the cup competitions and and so forth. So you might find actually we might go into a loan window because. The way the loan market is now, these kids are just going to sit in their under twenty ones, and hopefully we might be able to possibly get a few to give us competition. But again, it all depends on on our budget and what we're gonna what we're gonna pay for this target man if if it arrives. I think as well with that, Neil Ardley perhaps doesn't want to bring anyone in on loan that is not going to improve the squad, and he feels that whoever he brings in is going to cost a fair bit of money. And if that is the case. Looking to January, say, so we've still got six weeks, or whatever, but before the transfer window opens, 
say we get a target now, say we've identified, say for instance, for argument's sake, we've looked at James Hansen and we've been able to make it work and we can agree terms with him and get him in. However, we need to free up some space in the budget. We have to get rid of a player. Who do you get rid of in that squad? I mean, we have to look at one. Yeah, there's two parts to it as well because there's who would you who would you get rid of if you had you know autonomy to do it? Who can we also get rid of? So who would you? But is it likely that we'd be able to? So I probably would look at Paul Robinson in terms of maybe not. I think you could probably get him out alone. Um, don't forget, Pompey done the same to us, didn't they? Really, they sort of made him available. I know they made him available a lot in the season. Um, I probably would look at trying to get some players out who are not who are first. So Paul Robinson is probably the only one. Uh, Midfielder-wise, difficult. Dean Parrott was the one that we were supposedly thought was going to be sacrificed, weren't we, um, in the window. So do we, again, look at that? But then he's our only flair player. Um, we could lose Harry Forrester in the window. That's still a thing. So um, do we need a Dean? So if, we go, if Dean Parrott comes back, do we sacrifice Harry Forrester to, again, put the budget into maybe more attacking options? There's no doubt we are short. We might be short on two strikers up front. Because we haven't got the four. We've only got the two. We've only got Cody and Lyle. You know, um, Quezzy comes in, but can we can we confident that Quezzy's going to stay fit? We're getting caught with what we thought. We, we're getting caught out at the moment with what we were worried about when we got Quezzy. He's been injured within the first two months. What, first month? He got injured, what, end of September, beginning of October? Uh, so, in the Milton Keynes game, wasn't he? Yeah. So let's be honest with you. We got caught out already with Quezzy, which was always the chance, wasn't it? Um, but that pretty, I'm thinking about budget wise, the kids the kids are not on much money. So what's the point of loaning them out? We're loaning out our fee to Sutton. That's not saying that's an awful lot of money, realistically, because the kids are are very supplementing our squad. So it's only a big earners, which would be your your Paul Robinsons, you could argue. Um, that's the only one I think you could loan out and save some money on. Let's have a look through the league league one results on Tuesday night. weren't great for us, but had Gillingham. Or Northampton won, we'd have been back in the bottom four. So swings and roundabouts could have been worse. Division does seem to have been concertina, doesn't it? Within the bottom ten teams, I think there's only six points separating the twenty fourth to fifteenth. So looking at results on Tuesday night, who do you think had the had the best result? I thought the Warsaw result, unfortunately, for them kind of playing us on Saturday. I think that's a cracking result. Fleetwood don't concede many goals, so. To get four against Fleetwood, um, you know, a four-two result. Any win against Fleetwood's good, but Fleetwood don't get many goals in. Um, so I think that's probably for me the standout result. Not want to mention Shrewsbury losing. Yeah, Berry because that is, but that's, that, and that's what I mean. It's not a good result for Berry. I think it's a bad result for Shrewsbury. If that's all spinning around, I think Oxford losing at home to uh, Blackburn four-two. I think that's a shock. Is it four-two? Yeah, it was four-two, wasn't it? Um, that's shocking, really. Uh, Oxford team at the moment got no consistency. Um, when I was there, I thought they were one of the best teams, one of the better teams we played, and they put us to the sword quite easily. That, but they're not a four-two win, I don't believe, against that team. So um, Oxford at the moment are very indifferent. Um, at the moment, good one day, not good the next, and um, yeah, that was a surprise result for me. Well, what about you? Well, I think I need a little time to think it over, but I mean. I've asked to think about worst result. I mean, are you, are you saying then Shrewsbury becomes your worst result? Or Oxford, I guess? I, yeah, I also think Bradford losing home to Scunport was not a great result either. Bradford are starting to re- You have to look at Bradford and go, they're starting to pick up some really bad results at the moment, aren't they? I think they, should, you know, I think they are expected to be up in that top two, top three. Um, but I think a loss at home to Scunport, not great for them either. Um, there's a few, I think, I said, a few good results around, but Shrews were losing, losing a Berry. They were disappointed, especially some of the teams that they put away to then fall at a team that they would probably would be expected to win by, by a few. Hero of the week? Cody McDonald. He was my hero of the week last week. Yeah, I think he's still a hero this week because he's generally continued where he's off. I think anyone who can control an 80-yard punch from a goalkeeper um, and literally look like he's on elastic and then put it into the bottom corner when you've only scored one goal a season. Yeah, I think the mental strength that that guy has shown has been immense. And um, I do, it's really weird, isn't it? I think sometimes players win more respect for when for what they're like when the when they're not it's not going well for them. I think you know, with a, I mean, when it's going right for you, players, you know, fans go, oh, yeah, he's playing really well now. But 
I feel that Cody's won a lot of respect from from fans over the last couple of weeks just for the fact of how he's persevered. And I think people are generally happy for him that he's now um, starting to squeal. We all knew he was working hard. He just wasn't getting in the areas that we wanted him to. So I think there's a, I think there's a lot of love for Cody and he's my hero of the week. Do you mean he continued where he left off? Because continuing where he got off, I mind boggles, really. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was somewhat worse. Wrong choice of words. <laughs> no mention there for Luton Town as heroes of the week, no? Just your 10 goals in a week? Yeah, but... that Luton are capable of doing this. They did this last season, didn't they? Um, for them, it's... Not to the same extent, though. No, but they, they were... Luton are capable of that. Luton are capable of those two results, aren't they? For me, it's all about now consistency for Luton. I think it's... Um, it's going into the second round of games, you know, after Christmas. You know, them them horrible trips they first got have it sometimes the Accrington's and the Mansfields and stuff like that. I think their squad is by far the best squad in League Two. Um so now it's just about consistency. I'd love to see Lou back up in League One, I really would. Um but yeah, I'm not gonna say they're heroes because it's Lou, isn't it? Villain of the week then? I'm ignoring that last comment. <laughs> um the villain who ever chose a stupid camera angle at Oldham on Tuesday night. Is what was that ever? all about? Do you know what, though? I, I'm trying to, we've never... Well, it's been years since we've scored a goal at Boundary Park, so I can't really remember. But it, it must be like that all the time when you're watching it back or was on it TV. A, or, or was it a camera especially for beanback? Or did we just pick up the iFollow um, I think it was just iFollow. Okay. I think it was just one but camera. It, but it was a horrible... It was. It, we didn't go too much into the Oldham game because what can you go into on a nil-nil trap draw? But there was reports coming out that we played three four three last night. Hey, I couldn't tell. The camera angle was so poor. I couldn't tell sometimes who was going for the ball. Um, you know, Barry, I just call. I'm not very good at picking up who is who's in what position and formations. And but I couldn't pick up um, Barry Fuller doing that last ditch tackle because the camera angle was just shocking. So people say we played three four three. Maybe I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Um, but yeah, so the, my villain is whoever chose that stupid camera angle at Oldham on Tuesday night. The so we went down to Kings Meadow to watch it, didn't we? And yeah, we'll just say the club did a good job, I think, because I think that seems to be the eye follow footage. So costing the cost of putting that on for everyone was minimal, and it was yeah. a very well attended, very well attending evening. So I think we've probably. Whoever it's profiting from that, I think it might be the foundation, but they've done well. Done well. Do you know what? I think it was I think I think you're right. It was a great evening. All I would say is, um the from what I hear, Lorraine's dad was at the Carvery and it said it was really nice. Um I just think if they had got and it's gonna to go to catering again, so I apologise we're going down the same old beaten track. <laughs> but the amount of people that were turning up late last night, weren't they, and stuff, I think if you'd had a Someone doing bacon rolls, sausage rolls, or just something like a, I don't know, sort of a calf style thing. I think you've got even more money out of that last night because um, there, was a, there must have been in total in both bars, like, what we think about, what, 400? 400 people, 500 maybe? Sorry, I stopped listening. Um, yes, about, <laughs> about that, about 400 in that's, that region, that's a, yeah. That's good for midweek. That's really good for midweek for a game on beanback. Um, I thought that was really good. And um, I think the club, could I think they could maximise that even more um, profit wise? But hey, really well done by the club last night, and um, credit where credit is due. Boobs is what they want. So this week, as we mentioned before, we wanted to look at a couple of things regarding supporters and the way we are treated, being it, being it, be it financially, or in terms of the travel that we are expected to make. Or well, I say expected to make. No one's forcing us to go, are we? No one's forcing the 147 fans. Officially, that figure, by the way, 140. It would have been over 150 when you factor in everyone that travelled up to Boundary Park for a Tuesday night game. We don't have to do that, of course. We don't. We, cho- we still choose to do that. But most fans would like to go and watch their team live in the flesh, in person. And older boy on a Tuesday night, logistically, it's just impossible for many, many people. So we thought we'd look at the time and money it takes if you want to support your team in modern day football. So do, you, do you want to start with time or money? Um, you want to start with time okay so to start us off here I have 
listed some fixtures from the EFL this week. For example, here are some highlights. Rochdale, Rochdale fans, they played away to Oldham on Saturday and then away to Charlton midweek. Okay, spot the logic there. No, can't figure that one out. Blackburn, away to Bury on the Saturday, Oxford away in midweek. Carlisle, this is brilliant. Carlisle on Saturday were given Grimsby away. Okay. Midweek, as we have already mentioned, Luton. Swindon. <laughs> this gets better. Saturday, away to Yeovil. Midweek, where are they expected to go? Grimsby. Logic, logic fail here on a grand scale. In the championship, here are some highlights from midweek. Sheffield United versus Fulham. Fulham don't travel at the best of times. Millwall versus Hull. Again, Hull don't travel at the best of times either. And then Bristol City versus Preston. I mean, come on. Now, Sean Harvey has come out publicly and said, look, the reason they do this, why they tend to use the midweek fixtures for longer distance trips is so they can maximise the attendances for Saturday games when the clubs are more local, which is a great idea in theory. But there are a lot of theories that haven't worked out, like you know, communism, geometry, things like that. But I just don't see how, in the example of Carlisle, and even Rochdale, surely Rochdale would take as many fans to Oldham on a Tuesday night than they would on a Saturday. Blackburn would have taken... Uh, they, oh, they overtook Berry's ground on Saturday. They pretty much sold it out themselves. They'd have done that on a Tuesday night. So why, not, why are you getting them to do these trips in midweek to Oxford and Charlton? It's, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. In our case we'd have taken surely a great deal more than 147 to Oldham on a Saturday. We would have done. Perhaps perhaps double. I don't think we'd have had our Bristol Rovers attendance, for example, halved if that had been a midweek game. I could be wrong. No, it's interesting how you pick them, isn't it? It's a weird one, isn't it? Because like, Saturday games, I think, should be a long-distance one. I don't, I, I don't know about you, but there's nothing better than having a, when low, I think a local derby midweek is actually sometimes really good. Um, I remember playing Crawley under the lights midweek. Um, and you had a really good atmosphere. We had Brentford, didn't we, in the League Cup. Um, I like speaking midweek games. In a way, it should be like some local derbies. I think sometimes under the lights, midweek atmosphere. We all, we all know sometimes that the midweek atmosphere can sometimes be better than the Saturday because people are working. It's that release from work. They've had a hard day at work. Come in, have a beer, watch their team play, do you know what I mean? But to travel... I, I, a different angle from this, from you, and I don't want to go, don't, don't want to deviate too much from it. But you have to wonder sometimes how these clubs survive traveling ridiculous amounts of distance across the country. And this, and, you know, you can go down to a conference, a conference is just as bad. You've got part teams, part time teams playing in those. I still do wonder why we, why do we pers- per- persevere in the lower leagues with a national league? A different angle, but that's always my thinking. Why do we do a national league now? I think that ties in that and Sean Harvey's discussion about um, maximising attendances on a Saturday. I think they're decisions made for ideological rather than practical reasons. Now, I know we both know, don't we, that Trevor and Robin, the kit men, have had to drive up to Oldham yesterday. I think, what time did Trevor leave? He put it on Twitter in the end, didn't he? I think he left home at like half six in the morning. Does, doesn't get in until four o'clock the following morning and then he's straight to work. I mean... That no one's factoring in the effects it has on the people that are actually the lifeblood of the game because these things don't happen without such people and such fans. And what I would say, this is, and Trevor and Rocket are great, you know, I get on well with them both and they won't want me to say That's not what they say about too you. much. <laughs> and without going into too much detail about what they do, because they are unsigned heroes and they don't crave publicity or crave I do this and stuff, but the travelling is half the part, you know. They're getting kit ready. They're going to have to get kit ready for a Saturday. So they've had a Saturday game away. The preparation to get that kit ready for Tuesday and then get ready for Saturday, um, you know, that's something you don't see. So the travel time is in sometimes a little bit of a, a red herring because it's all that preparation time as well. The amount of kit we travel with seems to get more and more and more every year to the extent where I don't know how Rocket gets it all in a van. It's like a game of, it's like a game of giant Jenga. 
um, which I think he just loves to win. Um, Do you mean Tetris? Jenga, where you've got to take something out. Oh, yeah, Tetris, maybe. Yeah, that sort of game. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, Tetris. Yeah, you're right, Tetris, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. um, so, yeah, that's without going into too much because they won't want me to praise them too much because they don't do it for the praise, but they do a magic job. But I just think, would and I don't think it will probably go to Stuart Matt because while I, would, I love going up to Oldham, I love going up to Carlisle, I love going up to Rochdale, but I just don't know why you don't do regional league in league, in league one or league two. You'd be able to play teams that are more local. You know, you, you probably would get more fans travelling. Um, it's, some, it's ridiculous when you're having to travel to Carlisle midweek, but I would say some teams. It's just madness. If you were to look at the National League now as well, I mean, some of the size of those clubs is impossible. I don't know how Woking are managing with the likes of Gateshead and people like that in that league. It's It's mad, but... It would alleviate, I suppose, in the lower divisions, a lot of this travel issue. We'd still have some. If you were to split north and south, we'd still have... I mean, I've made a list of some of the away trips we've had in our time since we've got promoted back into the Football League. So I'm not even thinking of the conference days when we had a few dodgy ones. I mean, we even had places like Dorchester in the conference south of the midweek, which was, you know, asking a bit much. But um, So your, your Exeters and your Plymouth and stuff, I mean, you're not going to avoid having to play them. I suppose if you regionalised it, you'd hope that the longer ones again would be put onto the Saturday. It doesn't seem to be the case, does it? No, but you're right. You still, you still, and we've got Plymouth midweek away, if I remember correctly. We have, haven't we? Um, we have a number of a number of occasions. But you can live with the one-offs. It's just when you've got quite a lot of long journeys, especially Saturdays as well. Um, I think it's, I suppose for me, it's all about engaging fans and getting fans to go to watch live football. Um, it's all relating to money as well because how many clubs are charging loads through the gate just to accommodate for travel? I'd love to know how much we spend per year on away travel um, because I reckon it's quite a hefty budget. Is that your very subtle way of moving us on to the price of football survey? <laughs> I'm getting better at this, aren't I? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Never so. <sold. laughs> um, yeah, so BBC Price of Football Survey was released. It was released last week, last Thursday, I believe. And there's a, a few key takeaways from it this year so if we were just to look to begin with at league one so basically the price of football they do this every year the bbc they go through how much it costs fans to visit or support their support their team so it doesn't take into account like we've just been saying away travel and stuff like that and what people do and i'm sure there were fans that we know that there were fans that found various ways of getting up to oldham i'm sure there were others that stayed over which would make sense i mean there's a there's a hotel right next to the ground so but anyway i digress Key findings I thought were very interesting. Cheapest season ticket. In fact, we were going to go through this in, in full before coming back to and right into Wimbledon, but things I've picked that one out there. Cheapest season ticket is at Bradford, Bradford City for £149. And we've been long-term admirers of Bradford's ticket pricing policy. What is lost in that is that they have a stadium which holds, what, 20,000? So they have a lot of leeway to be able to do such things because they know that they're going to get people paying that, but if they get 2,000 people doing it, their income automatically goes up, as opposed to getting less than half that if they were to double the price, for example. So I think we have to be very mindful about the different... This survey doesn't take into account a lot of variables in this. It is purely done on price alone. But you have to think, naturally, London clubs are going to perhaps charge a little bit more, because their costs are a little bit more. It's just the way it is. Clubs with bigger stadiums have more leeway to perhaps be a little bit more flexible with their pricing. And also, I think it's a bit rich to say that the cheapest match day ticket is available at that club up there. You know which one I mean. Where home and away fans can pay £10 for certain fixtures. Well, that's because no one goes to watch that particular football club. And when they're at home to Fleetwood, for example, they're going to have pretty much an empty stadium if they don't do that. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. I wonder who the actual cheapest... Do you find out who the cheapest ticket generally is for League One? Does it mention that one? Do I need to go search uh, for that one? Cheapest single ticket, doesn't it? That's where it goes. So it does go with them. Um, but as you rightly say, do you know what I mean? Anyone can, anyone can get a ticket in there. No, you haven't got to pay either. Um, no, it doesn't. It's, you're right. It's all much... It's all much of a muchness. I've sort of... I, I've just been nosy and looked. Obviously, you know, ours is 200 and... 75 where Fulham in championship is 254. So I sort of 
I'm sort of being nosy on our doorstep to see um, if we cheapest, move, when we move. Cheapest season ticket, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm sort of looking, obviously, when we move, we are going to be looking, you know, Fulham are very active in, in Wimbledon, aren't they, and things like that. So, again, we're going to have to be as smart as we can. We can probably be cheaper because we have more seats to fill. Um, that sort of side of it. But it's all, it's all a bit of mushroom muchness, isn't it, really? There's not much difference if you look between League 1 and League 2, really. Uh, I think it sort of shows you in them leagues um, are not much difference. You've got some big teams in both leagues, haven't you? So, um, it's always interesting to look at. I think I was saying to you what I was interested about was just the the young fans. One of the things that had come up in the price of football was they looked at the young fans and um, are we doing uh, uh, the, the headline is young adult fans are put off by cost of football. Um, and it was just interesting when you looked at the difference between when you're 17 and 18 of how much that goes up when you're bearing in mind that those people potentially could be on university, coming out of school, going on to minimum wage. Um, and I, I suppose it's, that was the headline that got me of how are we keeping those fans, especially for us, because we have a lot of those fans, how are we trying to keep them, um, especially at that age when they can go either one way or the other, can't they? Yeah, hormones, you never know where they take you. But, <laughs> I mean, I will, I'd relate it to my own experience. When I first went to university, I got very, very lucky because we, I say lucky, <laughs> probably not the right term. But my first year at uni was our first year as AFC Wimbledon when we were in the CCL. And we were paying five pounds, five pounds for a ticket away from home. I think I remember getting that on the 15th anniversary of that Wallingford game. Do you remember we got those little sort of credit card sized tickets made out of card from Wallingford? I think that cost me a fiver. And I actually think that was more expensive. I think it's like three quid sometimes I'd get in for. I wouldn't have been able to have travelled to games, basically, if we hadn't have been a CCL team that season. If we had still been Wimbledon FC at Selhurst Park in the Championship, no chance. No chance. And I think the young person's pricing has come in. Students, I think, have always had something for them. But the, you're right, the young person's here makes a lot of sense. And I know a number of clubs have done them. We see it on their ticketing pricing when we go away from home. So is that something we can look at again do we have the scope to look at that currently or is that more something we have to hold off until the new stadium yeah and it's the thing i think you know we could we could be very critical here and go we do nothing for young fans but we also have to accept that we we have we have have limitations on our ground but i do think it's something that we can think about moving forward because if it's it's not just our problem is it the problem of fans at brentford at qpr at chelsea you know we're in a big London has a lot and lot of clubs, doesn't it? So is there something that moving forward into the new ground can we get upon? Because at the moment, and this is, I suppose we all, you know, as you said, when you, you know, you're looting and stuff like that, at the moment you've got a kid who's 17 years old, it could be a school, could be a university, he's paying £5 on the chem flow. Next year, he's going to pay 20 quid, And might not be earning any more money. The, 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 minimum, the minimum wages is not the greatest, is it? So, at that age, are we, are we doing enough or can we do more to keep those fans? Because we, I, you know, you, we look at, we look at, we go to home games and the demographic, there's a lot of kids, I feel, around that sort of age um, that we, we need to try and keep and not lose, lose them to other things. I don't think we lose them to other clubs, or they may do, because one of the things that come out of the, um, the survey was that actually the prices for championships clubs went down. And you've also got to remember a lot of premiership clubs now are doing schemes where they're keeping the ticket down. Some clubs are doing free travel. And they were saying now um, a lot of the championship clubs and premiership clubs is the, is the focus coming away from actually what's earned on match day revenue because of TV deals. So there is a, there is a the problem for the clubs who are below championship because there's such money TV wise that they can cut us very quick. They can cut out. They can basically put lots of lots of um, deterrence for fans coming to us and going to Fulham, for I'm saying. The TV money is a huge threat to clubs like us, League One and League Two, for that very reason. That money is just not. It doesn't cease, and I think instead of what we thought might happen, which was that the bubble was eventually going to burst at some point in time. What you're actually finding 
is that because of the amount of games that are on TV now, I mean, it's ludicrous, that fans are actually choosing to watch it on TV, which means viewing figures, which we thought would decline, don't seem to be at all. And the prices, the advertising rates, the contract fees, the, I mean, Sky will, basically, Sky will basically pay whatever it takes because they don't want to have to suffer the embarrassment of not having the Premier League. And that would be a huge embarrassment for Sky because that's their thing. Essentially, the whole thing, the, the whole company is built on having Premier League football, isn't it? And that's, a, that, as you say, it's, it's a huge, huge worry because we can't compete with that. I think when you talk about regionalizing the conference or National League or whatever now, it's a, got to be a realistic proposition for this very reason. How do you compete with that? How are you going to com- continue to compete? Especially now, we've got Saturday evening kickoffs as well they're being talked about. So you're potentially having three live Premier League games on a Saturday. Yeah, and it's, it's something that I try and say. It's something that when people uh, begin the season work, and it's why I'm so worried about getting relegated, I've I, I, I made the reason for it, is that people sometimes say, well, is it that much of a difference between League One and League Two? I think it is, because League One, you're only one promotion away from a championship. And I know at the moment we're going, oh, we could we get a championship? No, we've probably not got the budget, not got the squad. Maybe we haven't got a stadium, you know, if we're being honest with you. But if we go to Plough Lane as a League One club, potentially we can then get more fans, we may get more budget and that sort of side of it. But it's also the split of money. The TV money changes. So the championship club, on, on the TV deal that's on the table at the moment, the split is 80% of the money goes to the championship club. 80%. From my last understanding, 12% goes to League One and 8% goes to League Two. So it's only a 4% difference, but it's the major thing of... Eventually, League One clubs are going to be just as much as your championship clubs are scrambling to get into the Premiership. I still see it the other way. I still see it going another level downwards that League One clubs, because to go from 12% of TV money to 80% of TV money is massive. And it could be the difference now. So I always say to people, when you're getting this, you know, League, League, League Two is not a bad level. No, it's not. But actually, the TV revenue now is becoming to a extent where clubs. Much for muchness, but the money coming through the door and the revenue on the TV is astronomical. And the championship clubs are how the, how the deal. I still I still find it amazing how the clubs are allowed to get eighty percent of a of a TV deal for three leagues. So I'm real up. <laughs> I think I sense there's a lot of power plays from relegated Premier League clubs. That possibly manoeuvred to the, towards that one because I mean with the parachute money as well. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. It's it's a bit of a scandal, really, to be quite honest, isn't it? Um, I, it is, but you know, you've got clubs that are doing free travel. I think Stoke. I remember probably Stoke do free travel in the Premiership. Yeah, yeah, but again, again, I mean, how do you, we can't compete with that? We just can't. There's just no way. No, no. So you've got to try and find other ways, isn't it? And that's why I'm. You know, is it a case of those young, of those young impressionable kids of going? Do you know what we can do some young adults. We can get you involved in our in our club. Come and see live football, because otherwise you're just going to lose them to these Premiership clubs, or actually you lose them totally. And as you, you know, we sort of alluded to, they watch it on TV. I find at the moment that TV football is saturated with too much football, too much football. I, I love I love football. I love watching football. But I, I don't want to watch football every night a week. In fact, I get bored of it, which is, I never thought, I, I never thought I'd hear a day when I was younger of moaning there was too much football on TV. There is. It's just saturated with it. To finish up this, because we are running late. We're sounding great. Just run through. The BBC have done this very well this year, I think, in terms of breaking down each club and what you could spend. So apparently following AFC Wimbledon this season, as a season ticket holder, you could spend what they believe to be £846.40 which is based on ticket, obviously a season ticket, based on buying a pie, a cup of tea, a programme at every game where available TV subscriptions and replica shirts and stuff doesn't factor in away games. Apparently, if, um, if say, for example, I paid £846.40 following out of this season, it would take 236,295 fans spending exactly the same amount of money as me to cover Neymar's transfer fee. <laughs> yeah. And... Yeah, but then, but then you still want to pay his brothers off in you as well with your agents. 
Ah, oh, true. Yeah, <laughs> cost you another two hundred eighty-six thousand two hundred ninety-five fans. It would take four fans spending like me to cover the average League One player's salary per week. Mm. <laughs> mm. Which, if you're Liam Trotter, it'd probably take a few more fans than that. If the rumours are true, but I'm not going to go down that route now. Are you, are you picking on him again? Are you? No, I'm not picking on. We've got a new name for him, haven't we? <laughs> well, no, Kevin's got a new name for him. This is based on the fact that. Well, let's. In fact, let's just finish off this, and then I'll come to the Olden team because they were. They're legends, the Odden team. Just to run through, team shirts, £45, which is more than the league average, which is interesting. We always have been, though, haven't we? Because we always have been £45. Pounds, we do. Yeah. We sell very well, and it goes into the, the budget or the club, doesn't it? Yeah. And a pie, £4. We need to sort that out. <laughs> Let's not, not get involved in the catering. Come on. It's not £4 worth of pie we get, I don't think. No. no I'm not getting involved in catering because I would just... Um, it would go for ages. Let's just say that um, my dad and my niece got some food from King's Meadow for the Peterborough game because it was an awkward time on a Sunday for them. So they ate at the ground. And, uh, yeah, they won't be doing that again. I'm not surprised. League average, though, for tickets. We are just about bang on the nose for average now, having been for the past five years below average. I think we're slowly creeping up, but that's to be expected, isn't it? Let's be honest. So we can't really have complaints too much about about what we're doing at the moment right now. Sorry, I have to get onto this Oldham team. So basically, the Oldham goalkeeper, his name was, or his name is, Johnny Placid. It's actually pronounced something like Placid, but basically Johnny Placid. So as Kevin Boris rightly pointed out, that is actually ironic because that is Liam Trotter's nickname. So from now on, if you hear me referring to a Johnny, I mean Johnny Placid, a.k.a. Liam Trotter. Poor Liam Trotter. Really, I'm starting. Joe, you know I'm, I'm starting now. I'm starting not. not he, he, he doesn't need Trotter. I feel sorry for him, but he's sort of like taken. He's sort of taken the George Frankham role for me now. It's like thinking I'm, he's a player that I want now to prove the fans wrong. The George Frankham role is our next line in catering options. <laughs> to try and improve it. Um, right, I have to find this olden team because it's bugging me and it's taking me longer than I should do. But um, so we had Johnny Placid. But they have they have got the best named team in football. So Queensy Menning, Courtney Doofus. Yeah, I remember he came really on sub, didn't he, on Tuesday night? He did. So you've got Queensy Menning, <laughs> Courtney Doofus, Mason Fawns. Well, I'm sure he does, but don't really need to know. And where's my other one? Keen Brian. <laughs> Keen, I think it's Keen Brian, but from now on, Keen Brian. It's a comedy character if I've ever heard one. Who is this Brian and why is he so keen? Keen Brian. And of course, you came up with the classic, didn't you, on uh, Facebook Live? Oh, was yeah, yeah. The garden was replaced by the green, wasn't it? Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the garden was replaced by green. I oh, know. Couldn't write uh, it. You couldn't, you couldn't. But um, yeah, I'm, I tell you how boring the game was that you actually had time to look through their team and work out some really weird names. Yeah. My, and then the winner, which is hard to be because when you've got Keen Brian, well, I mean, you've got Keen Brian and Johnny Placid in the same team. They sort of, the yin and yang, they sort of even each other out, I suppose. And obviously, we've mentioned Mason Fawns, Courtney Doofus. What about Osmond Fanny? <laughs> oh, dear. The jokes are endless, aren't they? But we're well. They probably do need to come to an end. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's do Abdu, <laughs> are you? Oh, right. OK, yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's, what I meant let's, by. Be, let's be serious now. Do you know what I mean? Let's see if I can get this one. Oh, yeah. Let's see if you can get this one. Well, Jimmy was confused himself this week because he thought this player was still with us. He thought this player still played for us. Is that a clue? Yeah, that's the first cryptic clue, yeah. Really? He still played for us, so... He thought he did, yeah. Um... I want to get a cryptic clue one day. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, still plays for us, so... Nah. Nah, I want a clue. Okay, well, this will help you narrow it down. This defender has played for many clubs, most notably, aside from ourselves, of course, the famous Luton Town. <laughs> oh, no, not another Luton Town link. Who's the most famous player to have played for football in Luton Town? Uh, Mick Harford, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot Kelvin Davis. Who I used to have, I was a... Oh, mate. Um, Luton Town defender? Who's played for... Uh, I mean, recent years, um, Fraser Franks, wasn't it, played for both? 
<laughs> Going back further, I think Clive Goodyear plays for both as well. Played for Luton. Uh, Fraser Franks. Fraser Franks. Okay. Final clue then. He scored one goal for Wimbledon in 41 League 2 games. Oh. But he scored twice for Luton in 12 conference games. Okay, I'm going to say Fraser Franks. You're sticking with Fraser Franks? Yep. Is that your final answer? It is. It's the wrong answer. Who? Because uh, I think Fraser Franks played in the conference for us, but not League Two. I could be wrong. Possibly. I don't think he came up with us, but okay. Anagram? I think you might get it from the anagram. Yeah. Wit Law Nil. Was he a York defender who came down and played for us? I can't remember his name now. You were thinking of Dave Winfield, and no. Yes, it's not that. It's not him. Uh, didn't it? No, I can't think of it. I don't think... Really, I don't really, once I go to Luton, I sort of lose interest. Of course you do. He's a player that Jimmy Abdu thought still played for us. Does that not help you in any way? He still thought played for us? Mm, that was the first clue. Oh, yeah, of course he is. <laughs> um, no, I've lost this one. Dear me. It was Will Antwi. Oh. oh that's, a, that's the reaction. Of, that's the best reaction we've ever had. Oh. Well, how, how does that work in the first clue, then? That he still thought he played for us. Antwi. Antwi. He heard Antwi and he thought Jaden Antwi. Uh, okay. I get you. I get you. Cool. That wasn't an easy one this week. That wasn't an easy one this week. When is it an easy one? Well, there have been some easy, easier ones. Although, you know, last week's was a lot easier, but I still didn't get it. Okay. Well, who was last week? Lee Passmore. A number oh, of people week, got the in contact. The week before that was Kelvin, yeah. Yeah, the week before that was Kelvin. A lot of people got in to touch with us to say that they, they got it on the first clue. Of course. Last week. Well, of yeah. Of course. They said it because of the name. Do you know what we're going to do, right? Just to prove that I'm not a bad loser. Um, we are going to take, I think, Abdu are you on the road, I think. Okay. I think we just we will just we'll take it on the road and we'll quite happily do this on our Facebook lives. Um, we might bring we might even give some prizes out maybe, but I think we're going to take it on the road. So I'm and just trying I'll... to I'm just trying to compose myself. I don't want to get too excited by this by this breaking news. <laughs> and then I'll, then I'll just get the other people do get it right. I'll be like, damn. Yeah, you know that's going to happen. But anyway, do you know what? I got to stop saying anyway. I say that far too often. But anyway, Warsaw, big European tie on Saturday. Yes. They, are, they are based in Poland, but they do not too bad, considering. Great win on Tuesday, as you've already mentioned, against Fleetwood Town. They had lost to Gillingham at home prior to that, and they are only just two points above us in 15th place, so we can go above them with a win. Bizarrely, it's their first away league game in over a month now. The last time they played away from home in the league was October the 21st. They won 3-0 at Doncaster, who we must mention are falling rapidly as well. Dropping like a stone, they are. Last six... For Warsaw, they've won two, drawn two, lost two. I think this is not only a must-win, I think it is a will-win for us, surely. Yeah, they're, they're sort of club that when they come to your ground, you sort of, with all due respect to Warsaw, you just feel that they're, they're a small club. Is that sweet a bit harsh? They're, they're, not, they're a club that we should expect to beat, if that makes any sense. Of course, they, I know when we got into League One, they were one of the clubs that had always been around the playoffs and they had been very unlucky not to, to get promoted or some asset promotion. But I think they're starting to sort of fall away from that a little bit. Um, they, had, they, they, of course, do have their little messy in midfield, who I think is an excellent player and someone I'd love to play for us just because he's just such a good little player. But um, I don't see any other real major threats. And um, I'm hoping that they use all their luck or their good fortune up against Fleetwood and that we um, get some, some much-needed points and goals at home. So Otz Duma, the one you're looking out for on Saturday, uh, must be a Dan Adji mention in there scored on Tuesday night possibly yeah Dan's a weird one isn't it I'm still a bit frustrated that we lost him so early and he didn't play league football um, he's probably going he's probably playing at a level I think he will end up playing I'm being honest with you I think his level is probably league one um, but he does seem to be developing all the time doesn't he um, it's one of those ones where you don't even think you're welcoming back an ex-player because he just didn't really he left the moment um, he left the moment he got an agent didn't he but that's me being bitter um, yeah, he's doing all right, but um, yeah, Ozuna is the one that I think is the one to look out for. Do you think their squad is underperforming? I mentioned this; they've got John Whitney in charge, and fans are a bit, yeah, you know, they're not too certain about him at the moment. I think they got into the playoffs didn't they a couple of years ago, started since then, 
And I think that's where it's come from, isn't it? Because they they sort of tasted a little bit of um, they tasted a little bit of what it could get, didn't they? Really, and then it didn't really it didn't really materialise. So you, you probably you know the fans probably will get restless because that's what fans do <laughs> in a weird sort of way. So maybe I underperform them, but um, again, you know, I don't when they come into our place, I don't really see them as a a big club in this league. I think we're equally as big as them. Um, and I think we should be getting the three points. So, are you going to stick your neck on the line? Prediction, score line? Yeah, I've got a feeling it's going to be a 2 0 win. Okay. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I'm happy with that. I did say 0 0 for Oldham, by the way, and I was right. So, just, just saying, you know. Yeah, did I say 0 0? Just saying. Uh, I wasn't That's my yeah. safety score sometimes, is 0 0. I think um, you might have done. I don't know. I don't really tend to listen too much when you're talking, to be honest. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Don't say that word. <laughs> said not to say that word. <laughs> Looking at the other games of the League One, there are some very important games again. Uh, which ones have you had a chance to look? And if you have, which ones have stood out for you? If it stands out, well, the Blackpool Derby. Is it a Blackpool Derby or Fleetwood Derby or just the Northern Derby? Fleetwood Blackpool. I'll call it the Blackpool Derby, I suppose. Yeah. Northampton Bury, you have to look mm. at and go bottom of the table stuff, isn't it? Pompey Plymouth. That's always got a bit of needle, isn't it? Poppy Plymouth going back to sort of like they play each other in the playoffs, didn't they? Play the semis and yeah. a little bit of local needle. Um, Hold on. I'm not having local needle for that. It's locus, isn't it? It's locus needle. Local, no. I'm not, no. <laughs> the, well, if you go Just south. They're, they're, yeah, they're on the south coast. They are both on the south coast. I'll give coast, you that. I would not say Portsmouth and Plymouth are local rivals by any stretch. <laughs> well, they're more local than Poppy and Carlisle. I'm looking forward to that local duel between Ipswich and Lincoln. But there is needle. There is needle between these two teams. Playoff. I remember watching that playoff semi-final, two legs, and that was a that was a feisty game and two. Um, so I think they love loss between that piece of experience. The ladies team. They've got a league fixture. Denham United visits Gander Green Lane on Sunday, two p.m. kickoff. Which is yes, because they've got the FA Cup the following week, haven't they? At the same time, we're playing Charlton, which is unfortunate. Denham are struggling towards the bottom of the table. The girls will, however, will not want to. We'll want to avoid any slip-ups because just one point ahead of the team in second place who the team that shall not be named. So it's tense, it's tight at the top of the table. So it's very tight for the ladies. So hopefully they'll get a good result uh, against Denham on Sunday. Goal of the month. So we played the video, didn't we, that Mark Hendricks put together for us on Tuesday night during the Facebook Live sessions for the Oldham game. And we said if you would like to take your vote, we would collate all the votes and determine who the, the winner of the goal of the month was, which goal would win. And if you voted for that goal, we would draw your name at random and the lucky person would receive a nine YRS podcast mug. <laughs> nine YRS podcast. Oh dear, that's too tired now. We need to call it, we need to wrap it up quickly. So congratulations, we did a we did a draw. We did a random drawing. It was what's the word? Independent adju- independently adjudicated by uh, one of your Carl Park friends <laughs> and we want to say congratulations to John Manderson well done John if Mark has not already been in touch with you he will be shortly to arrange delivery of your nine years podcast it only took nine years mug so yes and mugs are still available for the price of £6.99 just email 9yrs at may14.co.uk and you can claim or collect yes. or buy or purchase your own nine years podcast, Mark. But congratulations to John Manson. I should probably mention which goal it was, shouldn't I? That would have been helpful, wouldn't it? Mm. It was surprisingly Lars Taylor's second goal against Rotherham at home, the midweek game, when Rotherham fans had to make that <laughs> long trek to Kings Meadow on a Tuesday night to see their team get turned over. And Lars' second goal was not only the only goal that anybody voted for, <laughs> it was kind of our choice as well. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us this week. It is time we finally disappear off into the sunset. Thank you for listening. Please remember to like and subscribe to us on all our usual channels, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, at 9 YRS Podcast. And if you're listening to us on our website, 9YRSPodcast.org, then feel free to leave a comment with your thoughts underneath. If you didn't manage to catch it, we did put out a Peterborough review and an olden preview last week. So if you were wondering, I've not talked much about the Peterborough game. It is all on that update. So, Peterborough game? Is that Bristol right? Rovers. Bristol Rovers game. God, I'm getting myself confused. Bristol Rovers, of course. Bristol Rovers game. If you're wondering, we didn't talk much about that. It is on that sort of 15 minutes on our website, 9 org. It's also gone out on YouTube. Uh, on YouTube. 
on iTunes as well. Really, I'm struggling to get through this this week, aren't I? It's horrendous. It's a howler of a show. It's a Liam Trotter-esque performance from me at the moment. <laughs> anyway, Stu, thank you very much for joining me. No problem. Thank you very much for listening, and please join us next week. We'll be speaking to Latix fan Ryan Kidd about his undercover detective work. Alexa Bliss. Yes, it's still Alexa Bliss. Bag first, milk last, and we will speak to you again next week. We need to probably do something as well. There's going to be people listening to the... Um, the very sometimes I put outtakes at the end and they stay to the end to see if there are any. Um, we probably have got some sure. in there somewhere, but I don't know. Yeah, we're full. So. If if not, do you want to say something to the people that are holding on, just for the for the outtakes that might not even be outtakes? Should we talk about Paige? Paige. Mm. Turning over a new book. Turning over a new book. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be <laughs> uh, I try to find, try find something funny with books and pages and not really. Not really. Turning, uh, over, funny? turning over a new book, I think, is probably <laughs> funny enough. Or bookend. Yep. Um, mm. <laughs> Have you been watching The Apprentice? Yeah, but we're behind on it, so yes, okay. don't do any spoilers, but yes, oh, wait, we don't, are. I don't want any spoilers. Just if, in case anyone else is still... The Apprentice. Yeah. Is anyone still, is anyone still listening? Any particular favourites? Well, for you, I can imagine who the, your favourite is. Go on. The blonde lady. The blonde lady. I don't know what her name is. I forget what her name is now. I don't, I don't really know. Jade. It's Jade. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, yes, it's Jade. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a no-brainer.